my work over the last four years has been developing investigative tools to probe the brain in order that we can start asking that question, how do psychedelics work in addiction? What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Trip Sitting Podcast, where we explore what it means to be human. I am your host, Cam Leeds, and this episode was so much fun to record and full of so much incredible information. If you're somebody that's interested in learning a little bit more about the science and what's going on in the brain uh, when it comes to psychedelics, this is going to be an absolutely amazing episode for you. Uh, with Dr. Rayanne Zafar uh, over at Imperial College London. Um, just a great individual, knowledgeable person, uh, so much fun to talk with. Before we get started, uh, this episode is sponsored by Conscious Retreats. Conscious Retreats helps you find the best retreat center for your plant medicine journey. If you're interested in experiencing ayahuasca, psilocybin, or iboga, we have a network of retreat centers that are trusted and vetted um, to get you in contact with just so you know that you're doing it in a safe place and you know that you're uh, you're going to be supported while you're there. Uh, be sure to check out Conscious Retreats at ConsciousRetreats.net. Also, make sure that you are following Trip Sitting on whatever platform that you're streaming this on. If you feel so called to, go ahead and give it a rating as well. Um, and follow on social media at tripsitting.blog. That's it for the shout outs. Here is Dr. Rayanne Zafar. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Rayanne Zafar. Thank you for having me, Cam. It's good to be Absolutely, there. man. We uh, so we met we met briefly at uh, Wonderland back in November, mm -hmm. um, and that was the first time I had ever heard of you. I think it was like Dennis that that like I was next to him, and he was like, "Yo, yo, you got to meet this guy right here." Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and then we quickly it quickly quickly exchanged info, and then just went about our nights. Um, but now I've since been following you. I guess before before. Uh, I, right when I started following you, you were not officially a doctor yet. Um, no. So congrats on that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I remember. I remember the Miami night. It was, I mean, Miami conference was quite something. And uh, yeah, I was uh, on the verge of becoming a doctor. So that was pre my Viva, and now now it's all done. Uh, so yeah, it's a different different phase for me. Yeah. Also, too, you're. Are, are you a doctor of, of, I believe I'm getting this right, is it neuropsychopharmacology? Yeah, that's right. A lot of letters and a big word. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I, get asked this, I get asked this all the time. And it is like one of those, it's quite basic. It's three words. The first is neuro. So that's understanding the neurons in your brain. You've got 87 billion of them. So it's a study of the neurons the study of the psyche so that's the human mind or the id in like you know some kind of psychological terms and then pharmacology which looks at how drugs can interact with both neurons to change the mind or how they interact with the mind to change neurons you know mm. you say it's two sides of the same coin so collectively what the what the term refers to is trying to investigate human consciousness diseases like just depression, um, addiction, mental health conditions, but more importantly, how drugs such as, you know, antidepressants or even psychedelics or cannabis or any kind of other kind of psychopharmacological drugs, how they interact with the brain and how they might be able to change the way somebody thinks and feels, whether, that for, whether that's for good or for bad. So it's quite an ambivalent term. Um, but yeah, that's essentially what I do. Okay, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Now you're 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 doing some really really cool research, which I definitely want to talk about. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about like how did you even get into this to begin with? Like, was this always the path that you saw yourself on, or as you went about your studies, did you know something happened and then you kind of took a left turn and and and, and ended up here? Yeah, well, I can't say that I could even pronounce the word neuropsychopharmacology. <laughs> old let alone know what it really was. Uh, so it was a later concept. 
me. So when I was younger, I am um, at the age of like 12, 13, I became quite aware of mental health conditions because of like personal and family related stuff that was going on around me. And I, and I became quite curious about what it, what it was that was leading or causing, you know, individuals to suffer. Um, and, and, and how that relates to our bodies. I was really interested in, from that point in the mind, and it became clear to me that the mind is this vulnerable thing that can be quite like um, receptive to your environment and, and it can make you have great times and bad times. But I was very much interested in finding out the core, the core reason as to why people don't, don't function. And so that was my kind of first bit of this is maybe what I want to go into. And, and because of that, I wanted to become a psychiatrist because that's kind of the most mm -hmm. obvious uh, to go in, in Um As I got older, I was born in Manchester, which is a town, a city in, in North England. There's a lot of a, there's a dance scene around there, a lot of electronic music scenes and lots of raves. And as I was growing up, I went to these and that's where I became aware of drug use. And I became aware that drugs also change the way the mind works. Like MDMA, for example, the classic one, it just makes you feel amazing and happy and euphoric. Um, and I was like, wow, so there's chemicals that you can put inside you and they can change the way you feel. Um, and it was during those times, I didn't really know much about neuropsychopharmacology at that point at all either. I was like, isn't it strange how these drugs can you know, change your perception of your reality? Um, could that be something that can help people with mental health conditions? So that was when I was like 14, 15. So let me, let me, let me ask you really quick. When you were growing up, like, did you have sort of a preconceived notion of like drugs are good, drugs are bad, drugs are neutral? Like what was your drug education like? Yeah. I mean, I, the education that I got taught was drugs are scary. I assume yeah. that everyone that took drugs were people with addiction. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't realize how widespread drug use was. I was like, yeah, this is, you know, quite a niche thing. Like only a few people do it. Like, mm -hmm. and if you do it, you know, you, it, life is going to turn out really bad for you. That's kind of what my upbringing was. Then it became quickly quite normalized. Um, as I grew into my 15, like from 15 onwards and throughout like actual going out and becoming a bit more of an adult, you start realizing drug use is pervasive in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to question drugs like alcohol really from an early age. I was like, what are all these sloppy, drunk, vomiting people? Because that's how rich people do it, really, yeah. um, is excessive. And I was like, this is just not, this is not great. People getting into fights. And on the other hand, you have like raver communities and, and on MD hugging each other and not causing <laughs> and telling and telling strangers that they love them. Yeah. I was like from a very, yeah, from very early age, I started seeing that not, not all drugs are born equal. And I classified alcohol as a drug very early on. Um, I came from like a, a Muslim upbringing and not religious, but um, yeah, I kind of understood at least to some, some degree why, Islam as a religion bans alcohol because of all mm -hmm. the kind of troubles that has, has been born from it over millennia in society. So in my head, I always considered alcohol not to just be this normalized thing. I saw it as being a, another thing. And I do drink, so like I'm not against alcohol, but I just realized that there's different drugs for different moods and effects. So then I decided I was more interested in understanding the mechanisms of the mind. And so I went to university, I did biomedical science and focused quite a lot on neurology, neuroscience and neuropsychiatry. So really trying to understand how the mind and the brain works. Um, and it was during that time that David Nutt and Robin Carhart Harris, uh, both professors, um, were doing their first research with LSD in the brain. So it was in 2016, 2015, sorry. And I just started university. And it was kind of at the same time that this thing was happening. And I became very aware of that research. And I was like, yeah, that is so cool. I was mm -hmm. like, I kind of didn't know that that's what I wanted to do. But now that that's happening, it's like, this is what I want to do. Like mm -hmm. that. And then after they, sh they did that first sort of study and then they did the clinical trial, I was kind of starting a master's degree at King's College in London, uh, which was affiliated a little bit with Imperial College. 
And it was really from that point onwards that I was like, I want to work with Dave, Dave Preston mm -hmm. and Robin. They are pioneers. They like think the same things about the brain and the mind and drugs and mental health, these like confirmation of four factors that I'm so into. So I sent Dave, Dave Nutt an email and I said, hey, are you offering any PhD places? And he was like, if you get a fellowship, come back to me. I was like, what the fuck is a fellowship? <laughs> 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 what is a fellowship? <laughs> like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like some thing out of Hogwarts or like Lord of the Rings. So I was like, okay, you can find some fellowship. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they do exist. And I found out that they're competitive grants, essentially. So you apply to like the Medical Research Council, which is the same as like NIH in the US. And mm -hmm. they offer you a salary and they offer you research fees. And um, you have to kind of write a proposal about why government, why taxpayers' money should be spent on you over like a four-year period. So mm -hmm. I made a case about the mind and the brain and developing novel treatments and the promise of psychedelics. And I wrote this about five, you know, I wrote this six years ago. So this was before actually most people even were in the game because yeah. I'd say two, three years it's been like, but when I first started mm -hmm. thinking about it, it was very much a fringe science and it was like, no, there was no hype. There was no, it was like probably about 20 people in the world doing this stuff. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, I went through this kind of really long interview process and lots of interviews and was lucky enough to get it. I was pretty shocked, to be honest. I Damn, was, uh, that's but, awesome. Because um, it was, I think it's the first PhD that the UK government had given out ever from taxpayers money to study psychedelic research. So it was pretty novel. Um, then I emailed Dave Nutt back for the fellowship. I was like, look, I got it. And then he called me, <laughs> he called me straight away and was like, ah, remind me who you are again? And I was like, <laughs> you just get loads of people and applications. And then I was like, okay, so I can start in six months. And I was traveling in Vietnam at the time. Um, and then he was like, okay, when you're back, come straight to Imperial. And I came and uh, met the team and then started in September 2019 and um, yeah so that was the journey it was it wasn't planned but I yeah. think it was aligned for me um in a weird and wonderful way yeah so when um, I'm, I'm just curious like when was your first I think like real psychedelic experience yourself I'm kind of going down that road um it depends what you classify as a psychedelic so what do you what do you count as a psychedelic like as in like mushrooms and LSD, DMT or like broader. So like, I, like, I, I think at this point, I, I feel like I have to include MDMA in that list just because of the way that everything's going with, with the psychedelic research. But I guess we'll, we'll, we'll separate MDMA. And so if that was before, tell me that. And then I'll ask about like the classical psychedelics, but I'm, I'm, I'm well, you know, actually, let me ask you, what do you consider a psychedelic? When somebody says the word psychedelic, what class of drugs are you thinking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the initial definition, which I think is the most precise of, of what psychedelic means, comes from two words. So the first, psyche, which is the mind, mm -hmm. uh, and telos, which is manifesting. Manifest. Or Mind manifesting. Yeah, so I think that term is amazing. Um, before psychedelic was formed by Humphrey Osmond in the 50s, it was called psychotomimetic which I think is mm -hmm. bullshit because it doesn't actually mimic mania, really. Um, yeah. So I'm glad the term got removed. So I think if you're going to use that core definition of mind, manif mind manifesting, mind revealing, then that's kind of like an ambivalent philosophical term because you can have a manifesting mm -hmm. of your mind throughout ketamine or MDMA or cannabis to some degree. But I think... I can also have a, I can have a psychedelic experience through breathwork too. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So if, if the word is to describe the visibility of the mind, um, then, then it can be loads of things. So, but I think I prefer the pharmacological definition um, mm -hmm. because it's more precise about the nature of the experience. So I, I would classify psychedelics as the classic serotonin to a agonist. So DMT, LSD, 5-MeO, um, psilocybin. Mescaline. Uh, mescaline, yeah. Mescaline is kind of a bit random one, but um, it part is part of that. And then MDMA, I think, is its own class. I call them empathogens. And then you've got ketamine, which can be called glutamatergic psychedelics. So I prefer using kind of neuroscience-based nomenclature. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, that, 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 that's how I, how I define it.
um, really. So, I mean, I became aware of MDMA from a young age, um, as I mentioned earlier, because it was it was commonly used in like Manchester and also the UK in the dance culture scene, which has emerged here over the last decade. No longer than that, I've been here for ages from the Hacienda in the yeah. 80s and 90s. But when I was old enough to, I went to these clubs. And for me, that was profound. That was life changing, really. It was a time to connect and connect with friends and, and family, not family, sorry, but just friends. And we, yeah, bonded in a way. And it makes you bond with individuals around you in a way that alcohol or any other drug doesn't facilitate. And I thought that formulated deep connections you really have this kind of um empathy for other humans and that's what mdma was originally called so mdma actually found itself from kind of pharmaceutical development and it was used by psychologists in the 70s before it went to the rave scene and it was originally mm -hmm. called empathy then so i think that's a really beautiful term for it uh so that was sort of like an experience of mine and and i guess actual like magic mushrooms lsd came a bit later on in my life i um i was it was sort of in during traveling when i went to kind of these like legal retreat centers um mm -hmm. that i came across and i thought you know i know i know a bit about this stuff i kind of want to do it in a culturally embedded way um as opposed to like a clinical trial um and, and there are opportunities to do that. And I've been involved in some psychedelic clinical trials. Um, but um, yeah, so I did I did classic psychedelics like magic mushrooms um, during, uh, during a trip to Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. And that was really profound, um, really insightful. Um, and gave me a lot of, a lot of time to think about myself and yeah. I think that's cool that that the first time we did it was actually like in that setting um, yeah. of like being at a center where you have the support and you're there just to do that and sit with it and, and really like feel feel the effects and feel the experience like I didn't have my first intentional psychedelic journey for years after I first started using psychedelics um, like every all of all of my use was like very like party recreational yeah. um, which was still which you know we're, we're still great experiences but it's it's definitely a different experience if i'm just taking it to literally just sit with it and just see what it does to my body like feel all of the you know somatic experiences that i have and see what happens mm -hmm. in my mind versus if i'm taking it and then drinking at the same time and going out to a bar and like surrounded by you know 50 people yeah no, I completely, you know, it's really interesting because in, in the UK, at least, psychedelic and recreational party settings have not been a really popular drug at all. It's only in the last like year or two that we're mm -hmm. seeing it occur more in that kind of recreational setting. So I wasn't really exposed to it as much. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't popular in that way when I was doing it either. I was just taking a tab of acid and going out with all my friends that were drinking. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you were a pioneer in your psychic psychology. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> a pioneer. Yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah, I think, yeah, it's definitely, because what, what I wanted to do was I wanted to give it the reverence I think it deserved because I came from it from a bit of a intellectually curious angle. And to be frank, I was pretty scared of of trying psychedelics before like because when you kind of read a lot about it and you read about how profound it is and yeah, it sounds terrifying I mean, if you really know what you're getting yourself into it's like the yeah. fuck <laughs> yeah and then and then i was like you know there is there's a part of me that really well and the reason why i didn't do it in a recreational setting to begin with was because i wanted it to be kind of given the level of respect and reverence that i needed it to in order for me to get maybe the most out of it and really explore the boundaries of that space. I wanted to really do it from a kind of personal eye shirt. What, what is the experience? How can we characterize that? Because I think as a psychopharmacologist, like a lot of my job is to explore the, the interconnection between the mind and the brain and the drug. And so I wanted it to be a bit of an experiment, I guess, on myself. Yeah. Um, so that was, and that's what I kind of did. And 
and yeah, it was, yeah, as I said, it was pretty eye opening and has informed a lot of my thinking around how to even do research with the drug. Yeah. So let's, let me move into just some of the research that you've done. I'm, I'm actually curious, what was, what was the first like research paper that you actually worked on once you, once you started your PhD? Oh God. What was the first one? The first one that I published. So I started off doing a lot of like cannabis publications because the psychedelic stuff came a bit late because I had to run the run studies and the brain imaging stuff as well came a bit late because you have to actually get the work done. So I did um, cannabis to begin. And that was really interesting because I'm, I wouldn't say that like I'm particularly fond of cannabis as a drug personally or recreationally. Um, but, and I also hadn't really done a lot of research on the effect of it until joining drug science. Uh, mm-hmm. which is the charity that Dave Nutt put up. So it was cannabis first, and that was actually looking at the effects of medical cannabis in children with epilepsy. So oh, sure. childhood epilepsy. So that was really fascinating because that was kind of really nailing how like a drug like cannabis can actually solve something like seizure. So it's not even mm-hmm. just about the mind at that point. It's actually a very neurologically focused disease um, you know, that's about you know, brain circuits kind of overheating, overwiring and overfiring. Um, mm-hmm. And the results were phenomenal. Um, we got published in like, the British Journal of, of Medicine, which is um, one of the biggest like journals in, the, in actually the world for clinicians. Um, and that was really important because it meant that doctors were reading about how so whole plant medical cannabis products, so those that include THC, actually can be beneficial to patients who haven't responded to all of the licensed conventional uh, anti-epileptic drugs. So our patients, um, on average, had a reduction of 85% in seizures. And we predicted that any child who has or takes whole plant medical cannabis has a 96% chance of responding positively to medical cannabis. Is any that child. with... Was that with like daily use or like what was essentially like the, you know, dosage and like how, you know, often and, and, and also the mechanism I'm assuming, was it like with, with edible or what was yeah. the, 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 the way of action? Yeah. So it was daily, daily dosing. Um, and they had oils. So the oils contained different concentrations of, of cannabinoids. So we looked at the CBD THC profile and we found that about a 20 to one, um, CBD to THC ratio seemed to be the average, although there was variability. Um, and it was sublingual, so it was an oil. Um, and some patients had it once a day, others had it some in the morning, some in the evening. Some of these kids were as young as like two and three. Wow. So parents were administering it for them, um, and they had prescriptions. Only two had prescriptions from the government, um, mm-hmm. which is something we're still fighting for at the moment, is to get this on the NHS. Um, yeah. And with that, with that, um, ratio of CBD to THC, like, are, are, are they even like feeling the effects of like getting high per se or not really? No, not really. And I actually think that this argument is quite redundant for not, not, I'm not saying that you're making it, but this is what yeah. we get asked a lot of the time when these, these, these children are having about 300 seizures a day. Um, That's some of them. crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and um, in and out of epileptic activity. Um, They're not in school, they're not functioning. You know, whether or not they get high versus what their brain is already causing for them, (laughs) it's like, they don't know how to facilitate a high. Whether or not they even feel it because their brain activity is so, during that moment, is is such a redundant argument. So the fact that these medicines actually stop the seizure is from insane. happening, yeah, and allows them to go back to school, back to functioning, that in and of itself shows that number one, it probably doesn't get you high, and even if it did get them high, mm-hmm. does it stop the thing that will kill them, which is the seizure? Yeah, like it's just a very perverse way of looking at like high and like the idea or illusion that getting high is in- inherently bad. It's, I it's agree. Um, and so, um, yeah, we were, yeah, th- but they don't, they don't get high um, as far as, as we know, because the, the, the doses are small and, and also because of the way that, because they're very impaired, the children, um, some of them, they don't really know 
a lot of them can be mute and stuff. So yeah, uh, I'm 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 curious. Like, do you know? Do you know how? Like, you know, cannabinoids, whether it's CBD or, or THC, is actually like affecting the brain? Because, like, for for example, with psychedelics, how it's targeting the uh, serotonin receptor. So, like, yeah. what's going on in the brain that THC is is you know, doing and that CBD is doing and that the different right. profiles even like is, is sativa actually different than indica? Like, are there actual fucking differences there? Cause yeah. in my personal experience, I don't really think so, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, but I'm question. curious. Yeah. So pharmacology, neuropharmacology is a bit different. So you, uh, THC binds to CB1 receptors and they're primarily expressed in the central nervous system and the brain, but they're kind of expressed all over the cortex. Um, and in some subcortical regions as well. Um, and then you have CB2 receptors, which are more expressed in the periphery. So kind of like in immune cells, um, on like blood vessels and kind of in the wider body. So THC primarily works on the CB1 um, and CBD works primarily on the CB2 and also some other different receptors that kind of sit on immune cells um, and it can bind to the CB1, but in a bit of a different way. And so the way that we think it might be working at least for epilepsy is that the THC binds to the CB1 receptor. And CB1 receptors are quite abundantly expressed. In fact, there's more can cannabis receptors in the brain um, than there are a combination of dopamine, serotonin, and opiate receptor systems. It's one of the most endocannabinoid system is one of the most widely expressed systems. And its role is to maintain balance homeostasis. So it does this by regulating our body's own cannabinoids. So we have our own endocannabinoids that we produce. We're actually cannabis farm and we don't even know it. Um, mm -hmm. So this regulation of these two molecules in our body is kind of tweaked a little bit up and down based on a feedback loop. And what phytocannabinoids do is they come in and they bind to the reception. They kind of push the system balance back into equilibrium. And so what we think is happening in seizures um, is that this kind of exogenous THC or CBD binds and it resets the system. So a system that's kind of overactive, such as... Yeah, so the system is essentially like in, in those individuals, the system's already out of balance. So like that's its, that's, that's its baseline is out of balance. So it's yeah. then working to then bring that back into balance. Yeah, that's what we think is, uh, is happening there. Um, so yeah, um, really interesting. Endocannabinoid system is a whole, whole shabam. I, think. I remember when I when I first learned about the fact that we had an endocannabinoid system, I was like yeah. blown away. I was like, "What the fuck? Yeah. Like, why weren't we taught this at all? Yeah. Like, when we were, when we were taught all of all of the different systems in our body, you know, when I was in science class in high school, they just completely left that one out. And it happens to be one of the most, you know, essentially it is the largest, largest ones. <laughs> it's the, the largest, largest one in the entire human body. <laughs> yeah, it's the largest neurotransmitter system in the human body. And serotonin is close to second, but there's a lot. The endocannabinoid system is pretty much critical to most disorders and diseases. Yeah, I think that's like truly true. Is like, is that something that's that they've only really recently begun truly doing research into because of the way that cannabis laws have going, or have these? Or has, has this been something that they've always been pretty aware of and just didn't really give a shit about? No. So I think a lot of so. Yeah, when in in the seventies, when your your president Nixon put all the drugs into class one, um, yeah, great all, guy. <laughs> not saying it's your fault, uh, but no, he's um, he he stopped international research, and and there was a death of cannabis research that resulted from that, um, and psychedelic research for that matter. Um, and then it was in like kind of the late nineties that it was resurrected by a very famous professor Raphael Meshulam and some others. Um, and they started understanding the endocannabinoid, they discovered the endocannabinoid system so it was Raphael Meshulam who did that. And then that was in like 97 or something like that. And then, so the last 20 years or so, we've like really brought back cannabis science and now we know a lot more about it. Um, but, and that's linked to the fact that there were these regulations. Um, so we haven't always known about it, as much as we do now. So that might be one of the reasons why it wasn't taught at school or taught in medical schools, but it is now being taught um, and biologists are taking it seriously. Some doctors take it seriously, uh, but scientists definitely do. And it's part part of educational programs is getting more, more traction, let's say. 
Cool. I like that. So moving on a little bit, when what was the first uh, research, uh, you know, paper or study that you were involved in that had to do with psychedelics? Yeah, psychedelics. Right. You know what? I'll say the one that's most important um, okay. work that I'm doing now because I've done kind of a lot of different things. But my first kind of major review and paper was looking at psychedelics and addiction, looking at the past, present and future. And this was a kind of scoping review of the field, but more importantly, what we what we know about psych, what, what the point of the kind of review and kind of thesis is that we know that there's a lot of evidence historically that psychedelics work for addiction. You know, you go back to Bill Wilson, um, he's a kind of psychedelic admixture to treat his own alcohol addiction. And he had a lot of trials in the 50s and 60s, which show LSD worked, you know, almost two times greater than placebo. Um, and you, then you've got these modern trials happening in New York University, John Hopkins, alcohol and tobacco. What we haven't ever done is understood really why it works. There's a dearth of knowledge um, in science generally about why things work in clinical drug development. And I think that's such a miss. It's like the most obvious question, I think, is like, okay, you see a patient recovering. Do you not want to know why? Is that <laughs> not gonna, is that not going to help to inform how to develop that better? What about for the patients that doesn't work for? Because it also doesn't work for, you know, some patients that does not, not 100% hit rate with any of these drugs. Um, so what the paper kind of outlined was our thesis and plan for as my colleagues at Imperial to kind of really investigate over the next two to three years, the brain mechanisms of uh, action of psychedelics and addiction. And so we set out a series of our own theories about how psychedelics work and what I did in my PhD was develop tasks, so brain imaging tasks that we can use in psychedelic clinical trials to really investigate and unravel the kind of magic or whatever you want to call it that's going on. Um, and so, yeah, my, my work over the last four years has been developing investigative tools to probe the brain in order that we can start asking that question, how do psychedelics work in addiction? That's so cool. Uh, and I think that that's, I mean, I think it's just like amazing that we are at a place where we even can begin to ask those questions and also begin to like truly understand them too. Like that's awesome that research has actually gotten this far because I've, mm -hmm. I've always been very, very curious. Like I think, you know, me not having any sort of scientific background and, you know, just you know, reading about psychedelics and, and all of that, we always just get like the very basic definition of like, oh, psychedelics are just, you know, like a basic reset for your brain and that it's, you know, calming the default mode network. Um, and it's, you know, putting down like a fresh sheet of snow so then you could slay down and, you know, make make different neural connections. That's, uh, you know, yeah. that, 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 that we normally wouldn't be able to. But like, I know that that's a really dumbed down version of what's actually going on. Um, and so I'm, I'm very, very curious what's yeah. really really happen like why why is it able to target all of these different things um and not just like one specific yeah know, way of way of action yeah so that's the david nut classic that's mm -hmm. the thing um i think it's a great analogy but analogies mm -hmm. like that they're just ways to tell a story and i think in science you've got to do a bit of that so you've got to conceptualize it for the public to understand. Oh, for sure. I wouldn't understand it if, 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 if it wasn't explained like that to me originally. Yeah. And I, I, I actually really respect the way that David does that. I think he's a great orator and explainer of the mind and the brain because it is so complex. But I think that the point is that it is that complex. So what we do know um, is that the acute effects of cytos, so when you take psychedelic, what it does is it kind of shakes that snow globe up. And the way that it does that scientifically is it perturbates uh, the way that the brain's electrical signals work. And it does this by going to these, what we call layer five pyramidal cells, which sit in the cortex and they control the excitability of the brain. And in normal times, that is involved in maintaining order of the brain and maintaining the brain networks. So you have the default mode network, which people have heard in far too much about in psychedelics. But you also have these other really important brain networks as well. So you have the salience network, which is about looking at your environment and seeing what's rewarding. You have the executive network, which is kind of like looking at kind of control. And then you have um, the attention, uh, cognition, sorry, and then you have the attentional network, which is kind of like, 
tied to the um, the salience network, and it's just kind of about focus. And so all of these networks kind of interplay at different times in order to kind of make you and take in what I'm saying and for me to take in what you're saying and not concentrate on like the mushroom on your chest or like the thing behind you. So these are brains working ways to kind of get the most important information in. Mm -hmm. And over time, our brains learn what's important and what's not. And in disease, what we see is that people overlearn to focus their attention on negative thought habits or biases. So this can be in depression, I am feeling useless. I am mm -hmm. not worthy. In addiction, it could be, I want another drink or I need another hit. Or in anorexia nervosa, it might be, I weigh too much, I'm not gonna eat. Anyway, all of these are characterized by ways of thinking. That are and so essentially your mind is then f starts, like learns that, learns to focus on those things. And as it's learning to focus on those specific things, it just gets more and more used to those things. So it gets harder to think in a different direction. It gets trapped and that electrical activity in the brain maintains the way that those networks hold on to that kind of mental schema. So mm -hmm. what psychedelics can do, which we don't think any of the drug does, is go into the part of the brain that controls how these brain networks are functioning and it completely disrupts them. So it increases the excitability of the brain and increases the entropy and those brain networks can no longer maintain those interconnections, which we think might be holding on to the psychopathology of the disorder. So acutely what then psychedelics do is they disengage that individual from their reality. That's why, you know, those schemas that hold you in place, your brain networks that also ground you in your identity. And when you take psyched out, you don't have an identity, you have this kind of ego death when you take kind of doses. And that's because your brain is no longer holding into these networks that maintain you as and your identity and your disorders. Yeah. So that's what happens acutely. So that's when we say the snow globe is shaken up because things have unsettled. Now, after a psychedelic session, the, the globe has to go back to a certain way. Mm -hmm. And what we found in our brain imaging studies is that the specific neural networks that are involved in communicating with each other, they reset in a different way. They don't go back to their all kind of rigid, segregated formations. Mm -hmm. Instead, what they do is they kind of, kind of cross over a bit more with each other and then they stay that way. And what we found in our study in depression, in patients with depression, is that those that did the best in terms of recovering from depression um, or greater decrease in depression scores had the greatest change in their brain networks after. So we could mm. almost predict um, which patients were likely to do better based on how much their brain networks changed. After. So just based on basically doing neuroimaging of them beforehand and doing neuroimaging of them directly after the experience and seeing how much change there was. Yeah. And you could then look, literally predict whether or not that was going to continue. Yeah. And in healthy people, we could predict based on how much the snow globe got shook up, how much increase in entropy was, we could pred predict at one month what the psychological well-being was. So those that had the highest increase in entropy in the brain had the best outcome at one month. So that was really fascinating. Were you able to, like, was there any reason why certain people had a larger change in entropy than certain other people like were there like were you able to figure out like what are the factors involved that this person over here wouldn't have responded to it as much as this person over here yeah so we're looking into that data a bit but what we're generally seeming to find is that those that had the highest degree of rigidity in their brain actually tend to do better and like have the greatest decrease, but that also might be variation to the mean. So this kind of shows that people that are more psychologically inflexible or more neurologically inflexible have the great, could serve to have the greatest benefit from psychedelics, which is also really fascinating because it's yeah. really helping those bottom margin individuals the most. That is that is really interesting, especially too, because like I'm I'm a big fan of of using psychedelics for the betterment of well people which i think is some term that i've i've seen somewhere um where you know people people like myself i've I'd never been diagnosed with depression anxiety any mental health disorder whatsoever and yet psychedelics have been one of the most helpful things to me 
but I would never qualify to go into a clinical trial like that or, you know, be, be diagnosed with somebody, um, be diagnosed by some doctor being like, Hey, I think you could benefit from psychedelic use. It's always going to be on me to just go and do it myself. And so that's why I was, I was kind of curious about that as, um, and that's just really, really interesting to, to, to see that you can actually prove with science what it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, and it's not, you, you're right. It's not just about those that have got an, an illness. So that, that, that second study that I mentioned was in people that are considered to be healthy. Um, okay. Even in healthy people, we found evidence that it can increase well-being, but it also changes the way the brain works. So we found changes in like why maps track in the brain that connect the kind of reward centers and the more frontal cognitive centers and it strengthens the connections between those two even in health people and that also predicts how well someone does after so you know psychedelics serve to benefit a, a vast section of our society not everyone but um you know we think that there's promise for a lot of people both patients and for for individuals who feel like they're out, they're doing okay and there's a there's a science now building to support that Nice. That's uh, that's really cool. So during these these trials that you guys are running, the way that people are taking the psychedelics, it's typically done with two therapists that are present in the room, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. It, are they are they interacting with the individual a lot while they're going through it? Or are they mainly just there like sitting back and taking notes or is like them talking to them also part of the protocol? Um, it's kind of uh, it's, it's, uh, self-directed and a self-directed experience with psilocybin. Um, okay. So it's a bit hands off. Um, we encourage we encourage participants to kind of go on their own journey and surrender to the experience. So they have eye shades on um, and they have headphones and they listen to music and like specially curated playlists to kind of evoke different emotional kind of feelings and thoughts. Um, and if there is an, a, you know, a situation where they want to speak or, you know, they'll be there to support them, but it's really psychological support as opposed to talking therapy whilst on the drug, we really want individuals to go in deep, um, mm -hmm. and have their own journey. And then how, I mean, how many sessions just, I guess, like, you know, preparation sessions are they having before they go into this journey too because obviously i know preparation is a really big part of this and i'm sure integration is as well so i'm curious how you guys model this while you're doing these trials yeah so i think it varies but about two or three um preparation sessions are usually about right um in order to kind of make the participant feel comfortable let them know about the experience get them to kind of write down their intentions um, about what they're gonna, what they want to achieve from it, um, and so yeah, it's a uh, it's prep is prep is a big thing, and then the integration after can vary. So um, we do an integration the day after, and sometimes a week after, and then some follow ups. But really, because we do clinical trials, we don't do long term integration, and that's of of some others. So there's some amazing kind of patient networks that we um, work with. Uh, one of them is called Saipan, which is a collection of our old uh, trial participants. And they host um, monthly workshops with patients that have gone through these clinical trials and offer support groups um, in and amongst themselves. And I really like that kind of way of thinking because it devolves the kind of healing to the community. And I think that's a really nice way of looking at medicine um, because it really puts the power and the autonomy within the patients and gives them, you know, the utility for their own treatment um so uh yeah it's it's, it's, it's something that's not weird because i think in the real world right we're talking about clinical trials and only australia is the only country that legally have this in the medical space so i don't yeah. think we really know the right way to continue with like long-term care and follow-up yet i think those questions are still unanswered and will be addressed um there's a lot more work to do in that in that space i think that what you said about community and like giving them the people that have gone through the trials like their own community that they can continue this work in just the idea of community in general i think that is so healing in and of itself like even take away the psychedelics and give people a genuine community that they feel that they are a part of like i think that's 
part of the reason why so many people have a lot of the addictions and, and mental health disorders that we do today. Again, I don't know the actual science behind this or any of the reasons. It's just my best guess. But like, I think we're more disconnected than ever. And so giving people a true, genuine sense of community and having these psychedelic experiences be the catalyst for all of that. Like there's, yeah. there's a lot to be said for what's going on there as well. Absolutely. You nailed it. Um, it's, it's difficult to put a cause to anything, but we can be pretty confident that the way that this current 21st century Western society is living is not conducive to mental health. We're all kind of living in this individualized kind of state of play. And that's maybe because of capitalism, capitalism focuses on the individual, not the collective. And I think that has driven loneliness. It's driven this kind of idea that you can do it. You've got all the potential. You, you know, it's all mm -hmm. about you. It's just oh. you hustle, hustle, hustle 24 yeah. seven. You got to get up before that guy, that guy's up at 5. AM. You got to be up at four. <laughs> yeah. But we forget that we're not, we're mammals and mammals are hardwired to be interdependent on communities. I think we've forgotten as humans that it's absolutely okay to need help. We, we, we are designed to not live alone. We're not solitary creatures. We're not, mammals can't function like that. We need others in order for us to thrive and survive. We work best in communities and packs and that's how humans survive. And, and when that disconnect that this kind of society, modern 21st century gives us, that will be the driver, I think, of what you said. It's a lot of mental health. So unfortunately, I don't know whether we can change society right now mm -hmm. because I don't know what the alternative is. Um, but what we can do is really try to lobby for connection. Because I actually think the root of all of this, including psychedelic, is re-facilitating connection with oneself, with one's environment, with nature, with loved ones. That that is the cure is connection. It's it's nothing else. That is so beautifully said, and that's where I think we're going to end today. So I want yeah. to. Before we do that, is there anything else that you want to shout out? Anything you're working on, or any resources for people before we uh, before we officially end? Um, not really. I'd say if you want to follow me on like Instagram or Twitter, you can send some apps. Um, and if you're interested in, you know, taking part in a study, if you're based in the UK, Imperial, we've got some exciting ones coming up for healthy participants, 5-MeO DMT and DMT trials, which is starting soon. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. It's been really fun to talk. Yeah, it's been truly, truly a pleasure. Like I, I, I set my intention at the beginning that I wanted to have fun and learn and I learned so much. So I want to thank you for, uh, for being so knowledgeable and, and just, you know, doing what you're doing to, to help be one of the pioneers in this field, whether you know it or not. I definitely don't think I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, um, but aren't we all? But yeah, it's, we're all doing our bit and you are too. And, you know, I'm really excited for what the rest of this space has to offer this year. It's going to be an exciting one for sure. For sure. Well, cheers, brother. Cheers, man. It was great to see. That is a wrap. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Rayan, for coming on the podcast and spreading your knowledge with the people. Um, it was truly a blessing to have you on. Uh, and I hope that everybody that's listening and made it this far uh, was able to get a lot from that one. If you're interested in working with me in any way, uh, I am accepting sponsorships. Feel free to reach out to me, tripsittingblog at gmail.com, or just shoot me a DM on social media. Or if you just want to talk, get in contact too. I'm always happy to, uh, to talk with anybody. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next episode.